Hi, good evening, everybody. It is Nicole Taylor here from Summit Pacific. I practice integrative primary care for those of you who may not know me. Thank you for joining me this evening. I'm going to be focusing on heart health and just an overall view, overview of the heart and how we can optimize our heart health and live a happy, healthy life. So to start, just a general review of what is the cardiovascular system. So it's comprised of both the heart and its vessels. There are two different major vessels, the vessels that move blood away from the heart, and those are the arteries. And then the vessels that actually bring blood back to the heart, which is called the veins. The arteries carry oxygenated blood to all of our organs and tissues. And then the veins carry that deoxygenated blood back to the heart so that it can be oxygenated by the lungs. So just a general overview there. Just a big overview of the general cardiac conditions. We are gonna focus primarily on coronary artery disease and that's primarily because that's one of the top causes of death. Um, all of these other conditions of the heart definitely play into coronary artery disease, and we're going to talk about each of those individually. High blood pressure, congestive, congestive heart failure, and arrhythmia, peripheral artery disease, stroke, and congenital heart disease, we're actually not going to discuss, but that's basically a heart condition that you were born with. The rest we're going to talk and to go into a little more depth with each one. So to start, coronary artery, artery disease, again, kind of the one I'm going to be focusing on tonight. I just want to break down exactly what that is so that as we get further along into the lecture, you're going to be understanding why we're doing certain things to treat or how we treat coronary artery disease and why we're doing them because it ultimately boils down to affecting inflammation and cholesterol levels. Uh, so basically you can see on the picture, that's a picture of looking at the artery, okay, kind of like a hose. Um, typically it starts with some type of injury to the lining of the inside of that vessel, okay? And that injury can be caused by multiple factors, one of which is definitely inflammation, chronic inflammation. Um, you have this injury, cholesterol, which is naturally a fat, it's very healing. It goes ahead and lies itself inside of that vessel, which does a few things, but one thing specifically is it actually makes that hole smaller. So not as much blood flow can go through there. And it actually, your body needs to actually increase the amount of pressure that it needs to actually get blood to flow through that spot. Um, over time, this cholesterol becomes more of a plaque, it hardens, and it continues to grow and that's actually called atherosclerosis, so hardening of the arteries, okay? Over time, um, and I say that this happens over time, that now we actually can detect atherosclerosis in children. So this can start in childhood and then over time build and worsen. Ultimately, this can lead to a heart attack. Uh, and basically that happens because the hole gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Blood flow does not reach that area of the actual heart causing an actual heart attack. Or you can actually have part of that plaque actually break off and travel. And then we're going to talk about what ends up happening if that is one of the scenarios. Peripheral artery disease we're not going to go into, but it is basically the same situation happening in the arteries that are in your periphery of your body. So that's going to be the lower legs and the arms, more commonly in the lower legs. 
So I think the main thing is being aware of your symptoms. Okay, the warning signs. Men and women can differ here. And so I want to focus on that a little bit. Um, there are symptoms that actually are the same between men and women. So if you can see, I know the writing is small, but at the top, the common symptoms are going to be that keynote chest pressure, pain or discomfort, uh, feeling dizzy, a rapid or irregular heartbeat, shortness of breath, and then pain of some sort, either in the arm, the neck, the back, possibly more likely on the left side because that's the side of where our heart is at. For men, it's definitely more common to have that left arm pain. Um, breaking out in a cold sweat is another symptom as well as actually some indigestion. And for women, the signs that are very different and differ than from those of what men experience are going to be this unusual fatigue. And this is usually pretty quick onset. Um, anxiety and sleep disturbances, again, quicker onset, newer symptoms, and then nausea. Now, obviously everyone's looking at this and we probably can all point out, I, I have nausea or you know, I do feel dizzy every now and then. So it doesn't hurt to obviously come in with concerning symptoms, see your primary care or come into urgent care, especially if you're experiencing multiple symptoms that have been newer onset. Um, you don't want to brush them off. So, you know, a lot of times it's easy for us to say, oh, I have indigestion. Oh, that's just from, you know, what I ate at lunch and I'm feeling tired because of this. And, you know, I, um, I'm short of breath because I walk, walked up the flight of stairs. So don't brush them off, get evaluated. Coming in earlier is key. So to just review some of the other, you know, cardiac concerns, um, diseases that actually all kind of affect each other. Um, high blood pressure, specifically, it's that pressure, it's that force that is placed upon the wall of that artery um, and that it's too high. So this will vary. Blood pressure readings will vary based off, meaning what's normal for you, based off your age, based off other chronic conditions that you may have. But generally speaking, blood pressure higher than 140 over 90 is going to be considered high. Um, this force is actually causing more damage to the lining of those vessels. And then that's where when, if you already have plaque buildup along with high blood pressure, the risk of actually chipping off some of that plaque and then causing a collection of a blood clot, which then dislodges is what leads to having a stroke. This is why we are so concerned about elevated blood pressure and focused on trying to lower um, blood pressures because it really, um, in conjunction with some other underlying issues that you may have going on, really increases your risk dramatically for stroke. So again, stroke is when a clot travels to your brain and causes a lack of blood flow, so a lack of oxygen and nutrients um, to that part of your brain. It's from the broken off plaque and then also clotted by blood that may be created by an arrhythmia, which is an irregularity of the heart. So we're gonna look, go into that a little bit on the next slide. Um, but if the heart's not beating exactly like it should um, and there's an, a little irregularity, the blood can actually pool in a pocket in one of the chambers of the heart and then with a good burst of a high episode of high blood pressure, that clot is dislodged and can travel to the brain. Congestive heart failure is actually another pretty common uh, array of symptoms that is typically caused by uncontrolled blood pressure for an extended period of time. Um, again, kind of why we are so focused on trying to help control blood pressure and um, decrease cholesterol levels. And we will get into that more. But what ends up happening over time is that if blood pressure is uncontrolled, the heart is really having to beat much harder 
to get that blood uh, or the, the heart, excuse me, is beating much harder, therefore increasing the size of the actual heart, specifically one chamber that is in charge of pushing that blood out throughout the entire body. Over time, because the wall of the heart is so thick, it's not really working efficiently. And so we get a constellation of other symptoms, um, edema, which is buildup of fluids around the heart in the lower legs and so forth. And then again, an, an arrhythmia is basically that irregular heartbeat. Um, typically it's an electricity issue in the heart. So there's a potential slight you know, blockage of the electricity uh, or it slows down at one part and it just throws off how the heart is beating. Um, and that then, like I said, can lead to a development of a clot, which then the risk is that that clot is then eventually dislodged, causing a stroke. So number one focus for tonight is how can you reduce your cardiovascular risk? And it really comes down to three major foundational items. Okay, the first goal is to decrease your overall inflammation. And we're going to go into each one of these and hopefully you'll leave today with just some really straightforward key points that you can actually start making changes in your own life to lower your risk. Um, so decreasing inflammation, managing your cholesterol levels and controlling your blood pressure. Now tonight's discussion is going to be really focused primarily on lifestyle factors and things that you can do to help uh, do these particular things. But there is always a place for medication to decrease cholesterol, as well as medication to control blood pressure. I know that just in my personal experience being a provider, uh, that a lot of people really shy away from going on cholesterol medication for one reason or another, and blood pressure medication as well, which is really interesting to me because by controlling these two things, you can really control your cardiovascular risk significantly. And it's not easy to make lifestyle changes. A lot of people do do it, and I have many patients that successfully lower their cholesterol and control their blood pressure with dietary and lifestyle adjustments for sure. Um, but if you are finding it hard to do so, it's really smart to start on some type of regimen to just help lower your risk while you're making your lifestyle changes. Because down the line, you definitely have the opportunity to start weaning off of that cholesterol medication or that blood pressure medication and see, are you able to actually maintain those healthy normal levels? So the first, first thing is start moving your body. And why, why is this important? We always talk about, okay, you need to start exercising um, because exercising strengthens your heart and your vessels and it increases the efficiency of the heart. Again, the heart is a muscle. All of your arteries and vessels are actually lined with muscle so exercising actually helps basically strengthen it just like it would help strengthen a muscle that you have in your bicep, like your biceps muscle. So optimal goals, okay, when, when you look at all of the research, optimally 150 minutes a week of moderate exercise is what's recommended. That breaks down to roughly about half an hour every day, okay? Now, there are lots of ways to move your body and you don't necessarily have to do that this way, especially if you're doing absolutely nothing at this point. So let's talk about how can you fit this in to your day, okay? Some easy ideas. Park your car at the far end of the parking lot so that you have farther to walk to a building's entrance. That may be your work. That may be when you go out shopping. Uh, but this is an easy way to get increase in physical um, activity into your day uh, for something that you have to do already, okay? Um, choose the stairs rather than the elevator. Spend part of your lunchtime taking a quick walk 
taking a break, even 15 minutes. Uh, on bad weather days, just try walking indoors at a mall or through a store. Uh, maybe waking up a bit earlier to be able to get in some exercise. And that could be 15 minutes. You can break it up throughout the day. It does not have to be a collective 30 minutes at one time, but could be 15 minutes when you wake up in the morning and then 15 minutes when you get home at night. Of course, the big thing is wearing fitness tracker trackers and um, tracking steps. I think it depends on what type of person you are and what helps keep you motivated. Um, so for some people, it's reaching a certain amount of steps per day. Um, and your minimum goal, your first goal would be 10,000 steps. Um, you may be just at home, grab, you know, two food cans out of your cupboard and just start doing some bicep curls while you're sitting watching your favorite show, you know, up over the head. At the end, I'll give you guys some ideas of some um, things that you can look forward to that Summit does actually offer to help with uh, exercising. Uh, but this is, this is really important. And so for those of you who are not doing any exercise, just start to think about how are ways that you can actually start integrating this into your day. And it may not be every day to start, but if you're doing nothing, two or three days a week is actually more. So this is a big one. So controlling what you eat, right? This is one of the hardest things to do, especially now with COVID. So dramatically within the last year, I have seen significant increases in cholesterol and blood pressure just based off our stress and how that has um, controlled what we're eating. I like this little meme here. I'm so hungry. My friend says, didn't you just eat? And you said, that wasn't me, that was Patricia. So it's this constant stressful uh, cycle of, I'm not feeling great, I'm stressed out, okay, I'm gonna eat. And it's really hard to break that, especially when things are excessively stressful in the world. So why, why do we talk about improving your diet? It's because that we know that foods are inflammatory. There are certain foods that are clearly inflammatory and there are other foods that are actually non-inflammatory and beneficial to cholesterol and blood pressure. Um, inflammatory foods are what can cause damage to the lining of our vessels. And we're gonna break down specifically those inflammatory foods and what, and which ones you really should be avoiding. Um, they actually cause that inflammation, that injury, with cholesterol being potentially a little bit higher, it comes right in and lays itself right into that vessel. We also know that having prediabetes and diabetes increases your risk of cardiovascular disease uh, and coronary artery disease, um, which prediabetes and diabetes are primarily dietary induced conditions, okay? Uh, so the most well-known, most researched diet or food plan, uh, food choices or options that we know can decrease inflammation, help cholesterol and blood pressure is the Mediterranean diet. Um, and basically those countries that um, border the Mediterranean Sea, they notice a trend that they tend to live longer and have lower instances of cancer and cardiovascular disease. The Mediterranean diet is also associated with lowering, lowered LDL cholesterol levels, which is that is the bad cholesterol. Um, and there isn't necessarily a Mediterranean diet because, you know, we are talking about um, Spain, France, and everyone eats a little bit differently, Greece, Italy, but they all have kind of the same overview, um, the same idea and similarities. Uh, this is a, just a very standard Mediterranean diet pyramid. And this is one way to look at it. Okay, there are some other ways. And again, you have to find what works for you. You are an individual and you need to find what is easy for you to integrate into your life. Um, so in general, at the top of the pyramid, so that's what you want to do the least of, that's going to be your red meats and sweets. 
so sugar and meats, and the recommendation is no more than one to two times a week. Uh, white meat, fish, eggs, beans, that's going to be the second uh, section down, um, maybe integrating those one to two times a day in, in your diet. Um, you know, fish, seafood more, so outweighing the animal protein, uh, like chicken or turkey more than, uh, and then of course, pretty much almost unlimited fruits and vegetables and whole grains. So on the next page, again, I'm going to identify for you a little bit clearly what that means. Um, so every meal should have at least two servings of vegetables um, and a very small portion of grains uh, such as breads, pastas, rice, etc. And olive oil. Olive oil is kind of the standard across all, um, very common in all of those countries uh, to be used both in cooking and raw, you know, on salads and vegetables. And at the bottom, what's interesting about the Mediterranean diet is that they really focus on community uh, and they focus on being physically active, being in community and actually having meal times together. And they focus on that being actually the foundation of living a long life. Um, so this has been a struggle this past year, for sure. Been restricted, you know, from um, being able to come together with family, friends, and to share, you know, in community together. So again, it's that circle, and we're noticing that as one thing is compromised, the other things follow, such as mental health, and then our eating habits, therefore our cholesterol and blood sugar levels, and so forth. So one other way to look at it is just very clearly what's inflammatory, what is non-inflammatory. And so it might be better for you to focus on something like this rather than worrying about how many servings per day should I be eating of this or that. So very cl clearly we know that the inflammatory foods, you really want to focus on trying to eliminate or at least decrease. And those would be pretty much anything white. So any of your white flour um, items like breads and pastas, you'd want to eliminate. Sugar itself, pure sugar and sugary drinks, that would include that as well. Fried foods, so deep fried foods, whether they're battered or not. Um, red meat, processed meats, you know, those are going to be like your deli meats and sausage, hot dogs, etc. Excessive alcohol. So we're going to talk about alcohol on the next slide in a little more depth. Uh, junk food, so chips, uh, fast food, and then trans fat. So those are going to be like your margarines and um, your um, canola oils, that are more commonly used, the vegetable oils for, you know, cooking. On the other side, we have the non-inflammatory foods. So these foods, they don't promote any inflammation and they actually in turn will help with lowering cholesterol and blood pressure. So fruits, specifically berries, are very high in antioxidants and very anti-inflammatory. And they also have one of the lowest sugar contents. So one of the better fruits to choose. Uh, fatty fish. So that's going to be sardines, salmon, mackerel, um, tuna, vegetables. I always suggest that people just focus on eating the rainbow. So mix up your vegetables. Try to be creative. Try new vegetables that you may not have tried before. Try not to get stuck in one color of vegetable like zucchini and broccoli, Brussels sprouts. Those are all really good, but red vegetables and orange vegetables have other nutrients and vitamins that you need as well. With oils, we try to, you know, I would say focus mostly on avocado or olive oil. Um, again, those have the beneficial fats in there that also help uh, lower cholesterol and inflammation nuts, lentils, and beans, you know, whole grains, those are going to be your grains that are at the least processed. 
Um, and there's many forms of them, oats, um, Ezekiel bread, you know, um, quinoa, brown rice, teas, white tea, green tea, and oolong tea, also very high in antioxidants and are very anti-inflammatory and beneficial, and dark chocolate in little amounts. Uh, and I do give you kind of an idea of how many grams that is. So if you do have a favorite dark chocolate treat, you might be able to convert that and look at, well, how many grams am I actually really eating a week? Okay, alcohol wise. So this, this is very interesting. So in general, okay, women and men are different. So moderate drinking for a female is up to one drink per day. And moderate drink, drinking for a man is up to two drinks per day. So on the screen you could see, and you can find this online, um, but those are examples of one drink. The size obviously changes depending on the type of drink because of the alcohol content. Um, so going from you know the left, a beer, uh, 12 ounce beer, if it's a more of a, more of a malt liquor, it's going to be a little bit less, and then wine over to, um, you know, hard alcohol. So this is another one that I see very imbalanced um, in a lot of patients, um, and and this this also would so this is daily, right? So um, I think in general, it's you know definitely for women, no more than ten drinks per week. So even if you're not drinking a drink every day, but on the weekends you are drinking three to four drinks per sitting, that's going to be the same, same thing. Okay, so if you're doing those two other things, integrating some exercise, adjusting your diet, you are likely going to lose weight. And we're not necessarily so concerned about the number on the scale, okay? Now, some people I know are kind of fixated on that and they definitely want to see that number decrease if they're making efforts and lifestyle changes. But really what we want to see is that your waist size is changing. Your belt loop is, you know, you're getting tighter on the belt loop or you're noticing that your pants are feeling a little bit bigger around the waist. That is truly the um, weight that we're concerned about. So the higher the waist size, the, high, the higher your risk is for cardiovascular disease. If you are a person that likes numbers, um, some things to look at are what is your current weight and having an initial goal of losing 10% of that body weight. That can actually dramatically decrease your cardiovascular disease risk. So example, if you're 150 pounds, your first goal would be 15 pounds of weight loss. I've definitely seen with 10% decreases for sure in blood pressure and cholesterol without being on medication. Um, another way to look at it is BMI. Now I know BMI is not everything, but technically, sleep, uh, technically speaking, if you are in that normal BMI range of 18.5 to 24.9, and this is based off your height and weight, that is the normal BMI range. And people who tend to be in that normal range tend to live the longest, okay? So those are a couple different ways to look at it. Um, but we do find benefit with decreases in weight and or waist size, for sure, with cardiovascular disease. Okay, the big one, stop smoking. That's easier said than done, I get it. Um, but this is something that your provider can help you with. You are not alone when it comes to trying to quit smoking. This is so significant. It causes one in every four deaths from cardiovascular disease. Um, even smoking less than five cigarettes a day has actually shown signs of um, cardiovascular disease or coronary artery disease. Even exposure to secondhand smoke can increase your risk as well. And it's interesting that smokers who actually quit start to improve their heart health actually immediately and their risk actually decreases immediately. Within five years, you cut your risk 
it, to that in nearly that of a person who's never smoked before. So this is worth doing. It's probably out of all the things that you need to change the most difficult um, but again, seek out your provider. There are multiple ways to stop smoking, um, medicine-wise, coaching. There's, there's a ton of different resources as well for you to help quit. So please don't hesitate to talk to your provider about um, your journey and wanting to start on that process. Okay, the next uh, thing is managing your stress. So this is probably one of the biggest ones. And again, this past year has really brought on a major increase in this already, you know, what we've already had as a baseline of stress. This um, past year, we've had a significant um, increase in that in so many different avenues. Um, and it's really important for us all because we know now it's been proven that this last year that we don't know what life holds, what the future holds. And so the stronger that you can become at managing your stress and dealing with stress will help you with any situation that we are potentially going to face within the next couple years or 10, 20 years of our lives. Um, this is a process, you know, to figure out how do I manage my stress? Because what may work for your friend may not work for you. Why is this important? Well, under stress, our heart does pump faster. Um, stress hormones actually cause your blood vessels to constrict. So again, you're making those vessels smaller, which the heart is having to work that much harder to push blood through there to get to your organs. And your body goes into a fight or flight response. So think of, you know, caveman, there's a stressor, which is the tiger. He needs to run from the tiger. At that point, all that's important is getting blood flow to the muscles. You don't want to be pooping at that point. <laughs> so digestive stuff stops. So the way I see this clinically is constipation. Um, and it's due to stress because everything has been shut down and the body is not relaxed and digesting. So you don't go to the bathroom very often. Um, and, and all your vital organs, actually, the blood flow is actually restricted. Um, and, and you have that increase in blood pressure. That's why we notice with anxiety that it mimics a lot of the symptoms of having a heart attack because your heart's pumping harder. You're getting chest pain. Um, you're getting shortness of breath. And we're going to talk a little bit about a condition, actually, that is a heart condition that can be brought on by a ton of stress. Um, as a result, over time, frequent or chronic stress will make your heart work harder for too long. And then when your blood pressure rises, so does your risk of, again, stroke and heart attack. Okay. And we know that most of us do have chronic frequent stress. Um, and it could look, and it could be good stress as well. Typically, the good stress might be short-lived. Um, it's the long, chronic, negative stress. Uh, and it could be different events happening, you know, throughout life. And that's what's most concerning. So common, some common signs. So besides, you know, having the physical effects, um, of our heart pumping and feeling short of breath. You know, these are some other common signs that I'm sure you are observing in other people and maybe are noticing in yourself, agitation. Um, and, you know, that could also be not sleeping well, so feeling very restless and agitated um, during sleep, feeling hopeless, like there's never going to be an end, is this ever going to change, there is no hope, self-neglect, so here we go back around with bad eating habits, not exercising, you know, utilizing substances to self-medicate because we are so stressed out. Um, personality changes, that's a pretty common one. And withdrawal, so not finding joy, you know, in doing things that you used to, withdrawing from your friends or your family, retreating to yourself. 
So how do we get, oh, I love baby Yoda. He's so adorable. So I had to add this in here because I think he's just so cute. So my face, when someone tells me stress balls are for squeezing, not for throwing at people who stress me out. So really you have two options when it comes to stress. You either need to change what is causing you the stress which is of course the more difficult one to do because sometimes we cannot remove ourselves from that stressful situation. Um, and then the second option would be if you can't remove yourself from that stressful situation, then how can you change how you react to it? Because that's really what it's about is changing how you react to preserve your health. And this again, very individualized. So what, helps you de-stress. And so I want you to let your mind kind of go and think about maybe something you did as a child that you really enjoyed. That could be art, um, maybe playing an instrument, um, something that you were doing last, you know, a year and a half or, or two years ago that you haven't been able to do this past year. I think it's pretty clear now that we need to start, you know, being used to how life is at this moment and kind of getting back in to our better behaviors that we had beforehand, because I have seen a lot of people on that path to improving their health and well-being, And then this past year has just thrown them off. Now it's time to get back into gear. Okay. Um, there's no point to kind of wait around till things change. Things are slowly starting to open up, but there are a lot of things that you can do from your home, um, to help de-stress and, and get back on track. So getting good sleep is imperative. If you're not resting well at night and getting good sleep, you will have less ability to deal with stress that following day. And then it just accumulates over time. Um, so talk to your doctor about this. If you go online, there are tons of apps that can help you relax and sleep. You know, aromatherapy for some people works really well. Caffeine, you know, have you noticed that, oh, I'm drinking five to six cups of coffee where I was really only drinking three? Well, maybe start to cut back by a cup every week. Um, journaling, so writing it down um, every day at the end of the day, just journaling, you know, your feelings that sometimes um, purge will help actually you be able to relax and sleep better. Spending time with family or friends when and if you can. Um, is big. And that's, again, that community, um, being together, laughing, and that might be watching a comedy show um, or laughing with friends. Learning to say no. So that's a big one as well is, you know, redefining what are your boundaries? What are you willing to do? And then being okay with actually saying no, if you really shouldn't be moving forward with that particular maybe task putting down your phone. And maybe along with this one, I should say, you know, cutting back on social media. Um, I think that has really instigated a ton of stress this past year is a little too much focus on social media, um, whichever platform you may be using. Uh, but, you know, maybe considering a um, technical, you know, technology curfew. So everything is being shut off at eight o'clock or nine o'clock or giving yourself only a period of time that you're allowing yourself to look at social media per day. Uh, avoiding press procrastination that can definitely procrastinating can definitely induce some significant stress. So if you know that's something that you do, what are the steps that you can take today to, excuse me, change that? Uh, practice mindfulness. So really, and I think this past year has probably, this is maybe one of the positive things has that has come out, is really trying to enjoy the moment. Maybe being home is an enjoyable thing for you. Um, actually being forced to maybe cook a little bit more and eat at home, spending more time with your children. Um, I mean, there's lots of scenarios and your situation is different than someone else's. Um, but being really mindful and aware of what's happening right now, not worrying about the past and not being concerned with the future. You know, physical contact is really important. So hugs, um, kisses, 
uh, those things actually secrete oxytocin, which is that same hormone that women release when they're having a baby. Um, but there's been research on this that shows that just being actually in a group of people, this was done with women specifically, that sitting in a circle, just being together, um, talking and sharing has actually shown to increase oxytocin levels, which is that really feel good hormone. Spend time with your pet or maybe get a pet um, and reading for some people. So there's tons, you know, here's more options on the next uh, slide. Music, listening or playing um, therapy. I've definitely have had referred, I mean, I, daily I refer people for therapy. I think this is a, a must. Um, can't go to the spa right now, I don't think. I think you can definitely do massage. Um, exercise, again, we talked about a hobby. So that's something maybe that you've let go that you are no longer doing, that maybe it's time to pick that up again. Um, and a lot of people have actually done this this past year, has picking up, picked up a new hobby or a hobby that they used to do um, that they stopped doing. Meditation, yoga, being out in nature, I know it's a little tough now. Today was a beautiful day, uh, but, you know, savoring those beautiful days and really making an effort to get outside and get into the sunshine when it's here. And again, that time management, so not procrastinating. Um, and for some people, that might be creating a daily to-do list um, or a schedule for yourself so that you stay on task. So again, it's, all, it's totally up to you to decide what it is that would help. And whenever you find, the third thing is when you find what it is that really works well for you to de-stress is that you just need to do it and you need to keep doing it over and over again. So Aristotle said, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. And so there's that saying that, you know, you can create any habit within 30 days. What's, there's truth to that, but what's not true is that, or the I guess the dif differentiating factor would be how many times have you done that in 30 days, whatever that behavior would be. If you've only done that behavior three times or four times in 30 days, you're likely not going to grasp onto it very quickly. If you did that habit five times a week by 30 days, yes, then that likely will become a habit. So that's really significant is just making sure that you repeatedly do it over and over again. Um, I spoke at the women's night out about habits and habit forming. Um, and one of the things that I think was the biggest take home for me that I really try and share with other people is that when you're starting to make a habit, and that's going to be anything we spoke about, the smoking, the exercise, the eating, um, the de-stressing, um, the first step should take less than two minutes, okay? So that might be, okay, let's say you want to be more physically active and um, you, let's say, maybe have a machine right at your house, a bike, a stationary bike or a treadmill. How can you make that habit easier for you? So maybe what you do is you just prep your clothes and your shoes and socks the night before and place it right by that machine. That took less than two minutes to do likely, but it's the first step at making that habit. And it might sit there, but you started the first step. So think about that with any of the things we spoke about. It's something, it's gotta be easy. It needs to be attainable. Um, try not to strive for things that seem to be a little too maybe out of your reach at this point. Um, that saying, go home or go, you know, go, go home or go, go hard or go home, you know, go all the way. If not, just don't do it. In this scenario, that's not true. I find that that's a really easy way to fail. I know, I noticed that in a lot of patients where um, they're really excited. I'm excited for them. They started a new diet plan. They have gone hardcore really fast into it, but they burn out real quickly. So with these situations, it's better to ease in, 
take your time and be very methodical with it. And know that, you know, if it takes you three months, that's fine. If it takes you six months, that's fine as well. But when you compare all that change that you did in that three to six months versus last year, you're going to be way ahead. So really try to take your time. So the last thing I want to talk about is this really interesting um, syndrome called broken heart syndrome. So this is an actual true um, cardiovascular I don't want to say disease because it's actually more kind of in a temporary situation. Um, but I think that this happens a lot and I don't think we're aware that that's happening either with ourselves or with our patients. Uh, but this is brought on by significant emotional or physical stress. So, you know, common examples would be death of a loved one, um, a divorce, um, physical abuse, domestic violence, um, loss of a job, you know, financial crisis. Um, and what will end up happening, it's more common in women, but there's a temporary change, and this is so fascinating, in actually the shape and size of the one chamber of the heart. And you can go online and look at pictures of how this shape changes. It's like a balloon. Um, most people, so this is Acute, it happens very quickly. Um, people typically think they're having a heart attack and it, it many times can be, be misdiagnosed, but there's no blockage found. Um, and um, it's the common symptoms of chest pain and shortness of breath. But most people recover in about one to two months. The heart actually um, heals and goes back to normal. Um, this might make sense with uh, the fact that there is, you know, that scenario where a spouse passes, you know, and they're older and they've been together for a very long time. And it's common actually for 70% of those people to actually also pass within the six months post that person's death. And they believe that this has something to do with it. Um, you know, at that point, there might be some underlying cardiovascular disease and someone may not actually recover um, in their 90s per se. Uh, but I thought this was really interesting because again, that significant emotional and physical stress can really do damage to the heart. Um, and, and we see it often that people will come in, feel like they have, they're having a heart attack, but it's more of maybe a severe anxiety attack or panic attack due to a significant emotional or physical stressor. Um, so anyway, just wanted to touch on that as well. So I think this brings me to the end of my lecture. Uh, I want to encourage you all to look at Summit Pacific's website. Uh, we have a classes and events tab on there. And not at this, right now we're only doing some, um, not only, but it's important, uh, diabetes education support groups and classes, but we do typically have some exercise classes available on there, and that will be coming hopefully later in the spring. So I just wanted to um, have you guys kind of focus and check that out every now and then, because over time, I know that we're going to be adding more events and classes and lectures um, that focuses on all of this that we actually spoke about today, um, nutrition and increasing exercising. Uh, and decreasing uh, stress. So thank you so much for listening and taking the time out of your evening to be with me here tonight. Take care.